baby on the deals, Nick. This is sort of the, 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 the last left we're going to have on distributed databases. But on, uh, on Monday next week, VoltDB is coming. And as I said last class, VoltDB is a distributed in-memory database. So a lot of things that, that we talked about the last two lectures will come up in the VoltDB discussion of their architecture. Today is all about analytical systems. The VoltDB is not meant to be doing analytics. Um, so some of the ideas that we'll talk about today don't, aren't applicable to VoltDB. Uh, but the but it can be, still be used for some analytical operations, but not to, to the level that we're talking about here. So again, the two talks we have, as I said, VoltDB guest lecture on uh, on Monday's class. But then, if you want a more in, more in depth uh, discussion about research at VoltDB, then you come to that talk at 4:30. If anybody's still looking for an internship, uh, I'll send an email out. If you want to meet with them while they're here and, and see what you know, what you would actually be working on at VoltDB. Um, I've had many students go there for internships, and they said they say they enjoy it. Um, just be mindful that it's in Boston, not San Francisco. So if you're, all your friends are going to San Francisco, if you go to both of you, you won't be going to San Francisco. Okay. Uh, and then the Swarm sixty four talk is tomorrow. As I said, this is a this is a startup out of Germany that is doing. Uh, they built a, uh, a query accelerator that runs for an, for anal analytical queries that runs on FPGAs. Instead of running everything to the CPU, they can shove things down to, to the FPGA and do faster computation than you could otherwise do. Um, so that talk is tomorrow, and that'll be in the gates, eighth floor, and then we'll, we'll be pizza at that one. Okay? All right, so, so last class we talked about uh, distributed OTP systems. We talked about consensus protocols, replication, uh, consistency issues, and federated databases. So I want to go over the consistency issues, the CAT theorem, just a little bit more detail, because I felt that was a bit rushed. And everyone's blank faces gave me the impression that uh, it wasn't sort of connecting what I was actually talking about and why it actually, uh, the cap theorem actually mattered. So I'm going to go over this sort of real briefly again, stop if you have questions, uh, and then we'll jump into the material about analytical systems, OK? So the cap theorem, as I said, was this proposal from this professor, Eric Brewer, that basically said if you have a distributed system that you, that, uh, that you want to run transactions on, you can only have two out of the three uh, properties. That it has to be consistency uh, available for all network failures, uh, and then partition tolerant. So as I said, you can't have all three. The middle ground is impossible. And it's been proven that it's impossible. Um, the, the systems, though, that are sort of out today, the NoSQL guys usually fall into the AP realm. So they want to be available and partition tolerant. Whereas the transactional relational database management systems, they're, some, they're usually CA. Meaning like if there's, if there's a disconnect between the nodes, they'll stop running. Right? That's the case safety stuff that we talked about before. And this is a void a problem that's called split brain, where both sides think they're the they're current master, and you start making updates, and you can't reconcile them later on. So the, the, the three example scenarios to show you what I mean for each of these properties. Uh, the first one was consistency, and as I said, here we have a replicated database. We have two objects, A and B, that are on both nodes. All the writes end up going to the master, right? So we want to set A here. We go ahead and can apply our change. And then we go ahead and replicate it now to our, to our other, other machine here. And then now, if anybody comes along and wants to read this object A, after we've told the outside world that we've committed this transaction successfully, they will get the correct value. Right, so that's a property that the data system can provide for you. That it's always going to be able to have strong consistency across all nodes uh, for all data objects that are replicated. And if I read something that I know from a transaction that's committed, I'll see the latest version. I'll see the correct version. The availability issue says that if a node goes down, then no matter, no matter what, the system will always still be available. We can always access the database. So in this case here, I had the, the database, again, is replicated on, on two nodes, and we have a master. So the replica goes down, and then no matter what, I can still go read that data from the master. And if the other node goes and wants to read this data, it, know, it can get to the master and read it, even though in this case here, in my scenario, it's not local to it. Right? So again, no matter how many theories we have, the database is always available to us. And then the last issue was partition tolerance. And this says if the network goes down, that now we can't have these two, the, these two nodes communicate with each other, then we can still allow the system to make updates and make changes 
and we're always going to be, you know, would we always be in a consistent state? Right, so that's difficult to do, right? So now if, if this guy here can't communicate with the other node, so he thinks the master went down, so it's going it's gonna to run Paxos or a leader election by itself, and then it's going to elect itself as, as the new master. So now when app the two applications, uh, the two instances of the application running on different nodes start communicating to the database, they're both communicating to two separate nodes that both think they're the master, and they both make changes to it in different ways, and this is fine, because again, each one thinks they're the master, so they says, I'm the master, I can apply this change for you. They send back acknowledgments, say that change was then applied. At some later point, the network comes back, and now we have to reconcile this, this difference between the, mas the two masters, because this one says A equals two, this one says A equals three, but that, that it can't possibly be if we were actually truly consistent. So now you can kind of see what, why you can't be all three. So I can't be network partition tolerant and be consistent and still available because I, I would have this issue here, right? So the, the NoSQL systems, they choose to be, in many cases, available and, and network partition tolerant. And they have these mechanisms that, to allow them to reconcile differences between the nodes if you have, have a disconnect like this, right? Whereas the traditional transactional OLTB database systems, they want to always be consistent. So what they would do is say, in this case here, if the network goes down and my case safety factor is, is, is two, meaning I have to have two replicas for any object in my database in order for the system to, to always be online, at this point here, both of these guys say, well, I, I can't communicate with the other node, therefore I assume it's down, and my case safety factor is two, but now I'm only k equals one because there's only one copy of, of the object, so then the system will halt. It won't accept any new transactions, won't accept any changes until the network comes back online and then you can then hook up back to with each other. So is this part clear? This, that's the sort of key difference between what the NoSQL guys are doing and what the, the tr traditional tr transactional OTP systems are doing. Okay? And again, as I said, anybody who says they defeated the cat theorem doesn't know what they're talking about. Okay? All right. So, just to remind ourselves uh, what we're talking about when we talk about OLAP systems, again, the last two lectures are about transactional systems, and these are uh, workloads where we're, in transactional workloads, we'll be making really small changes to subsets of, of, of the database. Uh, the queries are very small, usually, usually index lookups, and, uh, and we're actually you know, modifying the database. The analytical workloads that we're going to look at today, these are primarily read-only, and you're going to be reading large segments of the database, like complete table scans, to compute some complex join or aggregate across in all this data. And the example I always like to give is under OLTP setting, in an OLTP application, I can do things like an Amazon storefront. I can add things to my cart, make payments to my, to my account. I can only do that to my account, though. I can't touch yours. So my queries only touch, the queries that, that get invoked for my transactions only touch my data. But in analytical workloads, now I want to do things like compute the average price of, 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 of an item's purchase you know, with, within some kind of time range. Now I'm looking at all possible accounts, all possible customers. So the way OLAP systems are usually set up, the traditional way, is a bifurcated environment like this. And so you're going to have, on your front end, you're going to have your OLTP applications, or sorry, in your OLTP databases, and this is where you're getting all the new updates from the application, the transactions that are modified in the database. Right, this is where you're, you're ingesting new data from the outside world. And then you're going to have this, back, this giant back-end data warehouse that you're going to take all the data from the front-end guys and copy it over into this thing. And the idea here is traditionally you don't want to run analytics on your front-end databases because that's going to slow you down while you're running transactions, which, you, which is what you don't want to do. So there's usually a process called ETL where you're going to stream out the changes you get from the OTP databases, do some kind of transformation on them, and then load them into your, your backend data warehouse. And then now you do all your analytical queries on this backend system here. So this transformation process is, is usually things like entity resolution or data cleaning. So a classic example I always like to give is Zynga, the, I guess they're still around, right? The, what was that? Farmville, right? Those guys. They would buy all these little game startups. And they would, each of these game startups, they sort of left alone, and whatever database they were running, they just continued to run them for their game. Right? So that would be all the front end OLTP databases. 
But then if, they want, if Zynga wanted to do analytics across all their customers and all their assets and all their games, they had to put it into a back-end data warehouse, and they had to make sure there's a uniform schema, a meaning like if the column is, is in one application is, is first name and the other column is F name, we need to combine, you know, we, 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 they're the same thing, they're the same first name concept, we need to make sure that the, we, we resolve that and put that to the same schema. So that's what you do in this transform pro process. Or another thing too is, say I have an account on, uh, on one game, my first name is Andy, another account my name is Andrew, it's the same person, right? You don't want two copies of, 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 a, of a customer when they're actually the same thing. So that's what you do for data cleaning or entity resolution in the transformation process. So this is the very common setup. Right? And you, get, you get everything in this giant data warehouse and you, you do all your analytics on this. So what these are sometimes often called are decision support systems, the backend data warehouse. And this is where the, your organization is going to look at all the data you've collected from your OTP side and try to infer, extrapolate new information about it in order to make better decisions about the organization. So the, the classic example I always like to use comes from Mike Stonebreaker, where the, you can think of a decision support system would be like Walmart's backend data warehouse, where they keep track of every single item everyone's ever bought at Walmart, at every store. And so, say there's a hurricane coming up, and so what Walmart wants, what will do is they'll go look and say, all right, I know a hurricane's gonna hit me two weeks from now at this, this location in the US. What items were the most bought the one week before the hurricane and one week after the hurricane? And then make sure that they go make purchases and route the, those products to those stores so that they're available for, for, you know, both before and after the hurricane. So that's an example of what a de decision support system does. And again, to do this, you're, again, you're doing large analytical queries over large, large table segments, okay? So in this environment, there is a distinction often between what is called a star schema and a snowflake schema. So again, if you go out in the real world, you're gonna come across databases. If you see like a backend data warehouse, you're gonna come across the, these terms. This is sort of why I'm going over this. So star schemas look like this, where you have a sort of central fact table and then you have these spokes emanating from out it like a star that are called the dimension tables. So the fact table in the case of Walmart would be all, every time an item was bought, you have another entry for in, in your fact table. Like it's when, when an event occurred in the organization, in your application, right? So again, every time someone, someone scans something at the checkout line, you would add a new entry into the fact table. So this thing's always growing. Um, the, the, the fact table though will have foreign key references to these dimension tables. So this is where you store information about the, uh, you know, the, the, the products that you're being sold or the events that are occurring in, in your fact table here. Right, so in this case here, we have a foreign key reference to the product table. So again, this is, this is every item that ever, everyone's ever bought. And then we have in our product dimension table, we have information about the product name, the product description, um, and, and whatever category it belongs to. So in a star schema, you have one fact table, and then you have one level of, of dimension tables emanating from out, from, from out of that. Contrast this with a snowflake schema, where you're allowed to have multiple dimension tables or multiple uh, levels going beyond the fact table. So now in this case here, again, we still have the, the fact table in the beginning, in the middle for all the sales items, but now in the product dimension table, I've normalized out the category information about each product into its, its own separate lookup table. Right, so you, you can have these, these lookup tables going beyond the dimension table. So I'm going to take a guess why one of these approaches would be better than another. It's sort of an obvious thing that we're going to be talking about most of today. Yes? Uh, for example, if you only wanted information on like a lower, or like a closer level to the middle, rather than go all the way to the category, so you wanted to just like, based on code and name, you wouldn't have to loop through all the um, info about the category or the lower quarantine. Yeah, so he said that, say, if you wanted information about the category for a given product, he said you wouldn't have to loop through and get through the product, but what is that really called? A join, right? I wouldn't, if I wanted to get information about the, for a given product, it's category information, I don't have to join it with the category lookup table. So the main advantage you're gonna get from a star schema, and if you read most of the books on how to design data warehouses at a logical level for the application, they recommend doing 
star schemas because you don't have, you're only doing two-way joins at, at most. You don't have to go you know, several levels deep into, into the system or into, into, your, into your schema. And then again, this looks a lot different than what we talked about for OTP applications. OTP applications, it was like a tree structure. I have a warehouse, a warehouse, warehouse, warehouse has district, a district has customers, customers have orders, or, cus, orders have order items, right? It's like a hierarchy. Here, it's sort of emanating out from it. So it's quite different. So they recommend doing star schemas because you, you have fewer joins, the joins are less complex. Some database systems actually won't even let you do Snowflake schemas. They restrict you to doing star schemas. Um, but it's just sort of something to be, to be mindful of. So the two issues in deciding whether you want to use star schema or snowflake schema is that in the first case, for, for if you do a star schema, then you're essentially denormalizing tables. You're denormalizing the lookup tables into the dimension tables. And now all the same issues we talked about earlier of having redundant copies of the same, same pieces of data. And you have to make sure that you keep all those, all those things in sync now arise in this case here. Because again, you're, you're denormalizing the category, putting it into the product table, and now for each category name, you're replicating that multiple times. The, uh, so the snowflake schema seems sort of more natural to us as humans, uh, but the issue is now, because you have these, 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 these hierarchies, or not hierarchies, these, these, these branches from the fact table going out several levels deep, that's going to have more joins, and therefore the queries are going to be more complex, and that becomes harder to execute and harder to do query planning on. So for most of the things we'll be talking about today, uh, it doesn't matter whether you're actually doing Sternflake schema or star schema. Just sort of be mindful of, again, when you go out into the real world, you'll come across these things, and there's different trade-offs for, for each of them. Okay? All right, so what problem are we now we're trying to solve in a distributed OLAP system? So the problem that we have is that we want to run a join query. It's the most common thing. We're going to spend most of our time doing joins. And that's, again, that's why in the star schema it's, it might be better because you're going to minimize the number of joins you have to do, and that'll make the queries go faster. So we have some application. It wants to issue a query here. Just join R on S on some foreign key relationship. Just like before, in a transactional workload, we would always have one node be designated as like the, 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 the base partition or the home partition. We're going to have the same thing here. A query is going to show up at one node, and it's going to be in charge, for, in charge of communicating and coordinating with the other nodes to get the query executed. And then it will return the result back to the application. So what's the dumbest thing we could do in this case here? To execute this query. Say, say this query here needs to touch data at all four partitions. What's like the, the most easiest naive thing to do? Yes. Exactly. You just take all the, four, all the three of the partitions you need Oh, sorry, and copy them to the home partition, then do the join, and compute the result back. Why is that stupid? Yes? All right, she said it because I said it was stupid, all right? <laughs> Which is correct. Uh, um, th this sort of defeats the purpose of having a distributed database. Right? The whole point of having a distributed database was because we want to have store really large databases, and we want to get parallelism. So all we've done here is just paid a bunch of money to ship shit over to, the, to this node, then do the join. We could have just left the data there in the first place. right? So in this case here, we're not getting any advantage of additional computational resources because these guys, again, could just be shipping data. And then now we're sort of limited to how fast that one node can, do, can go. So we need to look about other ways to actually to, to solve this problem here. Actually, we're going to actually distribute out the queries, or distribute out portions of the query to our different P, uh, resources in our distributed cluster, and then combine those results and put them back together to, to make it as if, make the application think it ran on a single machine, even though it didn't. <coughs> and we get all the benefits of parallelism that we talked about before. All right, so today's class, we're going to first talk about different execution models you can have for uh, distributed analytical queries. Um, and this is actually what we'll talk about is, is actually germane to OLTP queries, but it's more of an issue in, in OLAP queries because we have to touch a lot of data, we're accessing a lot of data. Then we'll talk a little bit about some of the issues you have to deal with when doing query planning in this environment and how you actually send out the, the portions of the query to the different machines. And then we'll spend most of our time talking about distributed join algorithms uh, and, the, and different scenarios you can have. And then we'll finish off just sort of a quick 
overview of what kind of cloud systems look like today. Okay? All right. So the, the main dichotomy we're going to have in execution models for, 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 for distributed databases is this notion of a push versus a pull. And the way to think about this is the, think of it in terms of where the data, where the query will execute relative to the data that needs to process, that it needs to access. So the first approach is called the push the query to the data. So the idea here is that we have some query, which is small, right? It's like, you know, it's a SQL query, so it can't be that big. And we want to transfer the execution of that query to a, a whatever site or location the data that needs to process is located on. So think of like in a shared nothing system. A shared nothing system, we said, has its own CPU, its own memory, its own disk. So rather than having that shared nothing system send the data to another node to process it for the query, I can just send that query to the data. It can process it local, locally and then send back just the results for it. Right? The idea here is that the query is going to be smaller than sending the query and the sending the result back is smaller than actually sending the data you have to send over to do the query. Now contrast this with the pool-based model. This is where the query is going to run at some location, and I find out what all the data that I need to process it, and then I start pulling that data or streaming it into, into my, my, where my query is. Now you may be thinking that this is clearly a difference between shared disk and shared nothing. It's not always the case, right? In a shared nothing system, it's, it's, you could still do uh, both of these approaches, and same thing with the shared disk, although there is a, there's always the copy out of the disk into your, or one of the compute nodes. So let's look at a high level, what this looks like. So this is a shared nothing system. It's partitioned on ID, right? And our query shows up, it wants to do a join. So in a push-based system, rather than taking the data we need from this guy here and, and pulling it up to this node here, we're instead going to send a portion of the query, the portion of the execution that we know will touch the data that's residing on this node down here. We will push that down to this node. It then does the computation and then just sends back the result of that computation. So again, the amount of data we have to transfer in, the, in, this, in this environment is going to be much less if we're moving the query and the result around rather than taking all of this and shoving it up there. All right. In a pool-based example, uh, so this would be a shared disk model, we're still partitioned, but again, these are logical partitions. The data all resides in the shared disk. These are just saying here that if these partition markers are saying any query that needs to access data at this partition, uh, within this, this range of this partition, will be taken care of by, by this node here. So the query shows up to the home partition. We can then send the, just like before, we could send the query result sorry, the, the query fragment that needs to touch data that this guy is responsible for, we send that down here. So that part is like pushing the query to, to the data. But because we're shared disk, this thing doesn't actually have any data. It's out in the shared disk. So now we got to go out and make a request for the pages we need from the shared disk, pull it into our computation nodes, then crunch on it, and then this guy sends back the result to this node here. So this, this is where, the, again, as I said last class, the terminology is a bit blurry. For shared nothing, it's quite obvious when you're doing push versus pull. In a shared disk environment, you know, technically this is a push, but back here, since we had to get the data from the shared disk, it's a pull. Is that clear? Yes? Whose so statement is, wouldn't this always be a pull in a shared disk architecture? Yeah, so what I'm saying is, at, back here, I could have had this node pull all the data that it needs to compute this query to just this node here, right? But... Yeah, so he says it's not, not possible because this node is responsible for ID from 1 to 100. Yes, that's, what, that's, the, that's the example I'm saying. So we're going to push the, the query fragment that touches that data down here. So that part's a push. This part, when you go get the data from the shared disk, that's the pool. Okay? In a shared, again, my example here, the very first one, this was, this was a pool. Right? I got 
the, the query can run here, I pulled all the data from all these other guys into this node here. This could, this could have been shared, or sorry, this could have been shared nothing, and I still did this. So the point I'm trying to make is shared nothing doesn't always mean push, and shared disk technically doesn't always mean pull. You have to pull the data from the shared disk, but you're not, you may not be pulling the data between nodes. Okay. So another aspect of this, we will talk a little bit about is, is, is what the fault tolerance model is for these OLAP systems as you run these queries. Has anybody here actually run like map reduced jobs before, like in Hadoop? Very few. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an older technology. People don't, I don't, did they even teach it to you anymore? All right, it's fine. All right, so what will happen is, since we're running OLAP queries, they're, they're, they're read only, so we don't really care so much if we crash while the query is running because we're, we're not going to put the database in an inconsistent state because we weren't modifying anything. Right? Every, everything's read only, so we, we, it doesn't break if we crash. But it also means that if we have a query that's going to take hours or days, in older systems, uh, in the old days, you know, queries could take days. Uh, if we crash, if one node crashes sort of halfway through that query, then all the intermediate results we, we've computed are gone. And we have to come back and, and, and do it all over again. So in the, the mid-2000s, when Hadoop sort of and MapReduce at Google were sort of coming in, into vogue, they decided that since they were going to run on sort of really cheap machines, that any, at any point during execution of a query, they could go down. They essentially were going to take snapshots of the query at, a, at almost every single step along the way. So that way, if, if one node crashes during the computation, another node could pick up and, and pick up where it left off without having to restart the entire thing. So traditional analytical systems uh, would not be fault tolerant within a single query. If your query is going to take two days and it crashes on the first day, you have to come back and start all over again. The Hadoop world, they actually take snapshots every, at almost every single step in the query plan. And that way, if you crash, you, you, you don't have to start all over again. Now, in that environment, they, uh, in that environment, that was a design choice that they made, again, because they're running on cheaper hardware, but they pay a penalty of having to write things out every single time. So I think in newer analytical systems, the ones that are designed so explicitly for OLAP stuff, uh, you can tell it to do some systems and let you checkpoints as you execute the query so that you can, you can recover from that if you crash later on. Right? Again, we don't care about correctness or consistency issues in terms of putting the database in a, in a weird state because we're not modifying anything. But in, you know, we may have to redo work if we come back later on. Yeah, in the old days, I remember hearing stories. I had a friend that worked at, at Vertica. Uh, Vertica was a column store system that got bought by HP, and then now they're, um, then they got bought by a holding company. And actually, they have an office here in Pittsburgh, believe it or not. Um, they told me that like he he went to go set up Vertica for a I think an Australian telecom company, and they had queries running on some older you know older system that would take like days to run like one query, and then when they plopped in Vertica it would go to like minutes, right? Because it was a column store, did compression, did all this other amazing mo you know modern analytical stuff. Um, so now it's not so much an issue, but like in the old days it actually really was. But I think this is a tunable op op option in some systems. Okay. All right, so now we need to talk a little bit about how we actually do query planning. So there's nothing really new to teach you uh, how to do query planning in a distributed environment because all the same optimizations that we talked about before are still applicable in Germain here. So you still want to do predicate pushdown, you still want to do early projections, you still want to try to remove as many tuples that you know are not going to be needed for your final output as early as possible in the query plan. Right, but now the only difference is that you need to be mindful of where the data is actually located and how it may be actually partitioned in your cluster. So we'll see some examples in a second when we talk about doing join algorithms. But if I know that my, my, my data that I need to join is not partitioned on the join keys, then I have to do a bunch of extra work and start moving things around. So essentially what happens is in, in, a, in a distributed query planner, 
they also now start taking consideration the network, network I.O. cost of different operations. So when we talk about query, query planning before, we said disk I.O. was the main bottleneck, the main issue, so we always had that be our cost model. But now in a distributed environment, we want, we want to consider the network I.O. because that's going to be even more expensive. So what will happen is you'll generate a query plan that will have be annotated with information about where different physical operators in the query plan need to execute. And then you can break them up into these query plan fragments that you can then ship off to the different nodes that then do their computation on that portion of the query plan and then send it back to the base partition. So there's, there's additional metadata to say about, you know, compute this join and then send the output to this node here. It may actually not always go back to the base partition. You may want to do a, a sideways pass to another node that may need your data later on. Um, but all, again, all that information you figure out in the query plan ahead of time. So now what you actually send to the different nodes that, that are going to execute your query for you can, can, can differ. Could either be like a physical query plan, like the, rela the relational operators that, you, that you've generated at, on, the, on the base node, and you send that out to every node that, who then, that just takes it and executes it based on how it was sent to them. Meaning you're doing all your query planning at the home partition or at some central location. Another approach is to actually send specialized SQL statements that target each partition, who then can take them, parse them, and do query optimization locally, as if it was like a local query. So as far as I know, most systems do the first approach. They send the actual physical plan, like here's the join operator, here's the, the sequential scan or index scan I want you to do. And then the output of the query is just a, 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 a message to send that data to some particular node in the cluster. The only system that I know that actually does the second approach is MemSQL. And they sort of extend SQL, the, the, their dialect to SQL with some additional information about, again, where the data is going to come from, where it needs to go to after you complete the query. But the idea here, which I actually sort of agree with in some ways, is that rather than having the, the, a centralized query planner, make decisions about how it's ex going to execute every query plan fragment, they just have the local node do that, do that for them. And the idea there is like the local node would have the best information about what the data actually looks like, uh, and you don't have to worry about keeping some global thing in sync. So just visualize, to visualize what I, what I actually mean, so say again, this is our join query we want to send out. We have three partitions. We could just send, again, we generate, turn the SQL into a physical relational plan, and then we just send out those query plan fragments for that relational plan to every single node who then just take it and execute it, just as if it was generated locally. But what MemSQL does is they actually will rewrite the SQL query to now target the data that's at each, each partition. So now we added a where clause to just say, touch the data that, that each partition knows about. This then node gets that data runs it through the SQL parser and the query optimizer, and generates a physical plan for itself, just on the data that, that it knows about. So in some ways, to think about this again, if, if we don't send SQL statements, we're running query, the query optimizer in parallel on three different nodes. If we send query plan fragments to the actual physical plan, then we run the query optimizer once in some central location. We hope that our catalogs are in sync and statistics are in sync to make good decisions, and then we just send those plan fragments down. And then you get back the results, and you union them together, and that's the final result you send to the application. Again, as far as you know, MemSQL is the only one that does this. I think it's an interesting idea. Um, and uh, I, I don't know if anybody else does this. So, OK. So now, as I said, the efficiency of the distributed query plan is going to depend a lot, what, a lot, it's going to depend a lot on what the actual tables look like. And as I said, the joins are the things we're going to spend most of our time doing. So this is the one we really need to be, be mindful about what the data looks like and where it's located in order to make the best decisions about how to, to compute the join. So the, the easiest approach that we saw in the beginning was that we're just going to take the, the, every single table that we want to compute in our join, we're just going to put it onto a single node and then compute the, compute the join locally. But we obviously, we're going to lose all the parallels and benefits we get from having additional resources. It may also be the case that the database doesn't even fit, or the two tables we want to join don't even fit on a single node. Right? And then, therefore, we're, we're sending a lot of data around, and, and, and the joiner just end up failing. So 
the way we're going to do this is that, again, we're going to look at how the tables are partitioned or whether they're replicated. Figure out how we can then move data to different nodes by in, in, with the, moving the least amount of data as possible so that we get the data that we need to compute the join at each node and they don't need to communicate with any other node during the join and then they compute their final result and then send that back to a centralized location that we can union the result together. So now, once you get all the data on the node to compute the join, uh, you can just use all the same join algorithms we spent a lot of time talking about before. Nested loop join, sort merge join, hash join. Right? There's, no, there's no magical distributed hash join algorithm that's going to be completely different than, than what we talked about before. You build a hash table, then you probe it. Right? So once we get the data we want in the right location, we just use the same join algorithms that we talked about before. So there's going to be four scenarios we have to, be, we have to take, take care of in, in a distributed environment. So the first one's going to be where one of the tables that we want to join is replicated at every single node. All right, so this, think of this as like when we talked about the star schema and the snowflake schema, the fact table is going to be huge. The fact table is going to have, again, people have, there's probably billions of items I've bought at Walmart and, since they've ever started. That, so that table is going to be massive. So that's going to be partitioned and, and stored separately on different nodes. But things like the dimension tables, those are going to be much smaller. They're going to be either read only or read mostly. And therefore, we can replicate that on every single node so that when we compute the join, we don't have to go look around to try to find where the data we need is for, for, the, for the other table. It's right there uh, for us. So to a classic example of a dimension table would be like the zip code table for, for addresses in the US. There's only like 35,000 zip codes in the United States. The post office updates them four times a year. So that's, that's a small table we can replicate at every single node. So all we need to do here is this, the, we just do our local join at every single node. And this is here, S is replicated, R is partitioned. So we just do whatever local join algorithm we want at each partition, and then we ship the result from one node to a central location, union the result together, and then that's the final, the final answer. All right? So that's pretty straightforward. The next scenario is where the... I mean, so we're, we're, we're going in order of like best case scenario to worst case scenario. So a, another good setup is also when the, when the two tables you want to join are both partitioned on the join key. So we know that all the data we could ever need to, to examine one tuple from the outer, outer table, that the tuple in the inner table will always be at, at my partition. Right? So again, both of these are partitioned on SIDs, or, sorry, on, on the ID column, and the range of those values are exactly matching for uh, at each partition. So this is 1 to 100, this is 1 to 1 to 200. So for any tuple with a given ID for R, I know that it can, the, the matching tuple in S has to be at my partition. It won't be at, at another location. So again, all I need to do is just do my local join as if I was a single node system, get the output at every a partition, and send that to a centralized location and we combine together and we, and we get the result. All right? Also pretty straightforward. All right, so the next setup is where the, the two tables are partitioned but one of the tables is not partitioned on our join key. So again, ID and the ID column in R is, is partitioned, uh, the, uh, the, the, the R table is partitioned on ID, and that's what we're doing, a lookup in the join, but the S table is partitioned on value. So can we do a local join? No, right, because for some ID, say ID 99, I have no idea whether it's, it's going to be in here or over here, right? So the worst case, the worst thing I could possibly do is as I'm looping through every single tuple in the outer table, go do a broadcast message to every single tuple, or every single other partition to say, hey, do you have this ID for me? Right? That would be super slow because now every other node is doing the same thing. So what we're going to do here is if we recognize that the table that's one of the tables that we want to do a join on that's not partitioned on our, on our join key, if it's actually small enough, then what we can do is just do a, uh, a broadcast where 
every single partition is going to send the contents of their table to every other partition. So that now every partition now has a complete copy of the table S. So in this case here, I take my contents of S, of S here, and I send it to this partition. And then on the other side, I take my contents of S here, and send it to, the, to this partition. Right? And now I'm back where I was in the first scenario, where one of the tables was replicated at every single partition. So at this point here, after I, I do this, this data movement, I can then compute the join locally, then ship my result to the central location and combine them. So sometimes you'll see this be called a broadcast join. Uh, again, it, or sometimes it's also called a broadcast hash join, a pro broadcast sort merge join, right? The, I, the IE is the same. You always have to have this first broadcast step where every node is going to broadcast to every other node. Here's the data for one of the tables you want to join on. And just like before, when we, we would pick the, the, you know, the smaller table versus the, uh, the, the larger table, whether that's going to be the inner, the inner table versus the outer table for our join, we always want to pick the smaller table in terms of the amount of data we're sending to, the, 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 to be the one that we broadcast to everyone else. All right, the last scenario is, is the worst case scenario. And this is where both tables are not partitioned at all on our join key. So in this case here, the R table is partitioned on, on name, the S table is partitioned on value. So we can't, again, we can't compute any local join here because we don't know whether there's a, there, there'll be a tuple that matches on the outer table, the inner table with the same ID at any other nodes. So we'd have to send messages to everyone else to try to figure out, you know, do they have a match for us? So here what we're going to do is called a shuffle or a reshuffle. And the way to think about this is we're essentially just going to be doing repartitioning of our tables on the fly. But this is only for this query. Meaning after we the query is done, we throw away the data we, we've, we've shuffled around. So what we're going to do is we're going to have this node, just like before, send its contents of R to this node. When, yeah, sorry. This node here is going to say, all right, well, I know I want to send a part my partitions data where ID is 101 to 200 to this node here. So it just sends that the middle amount of data there. And likewise, it generates a new partition here where it says, all right, from 101 to 200, my contents of R goes up into there. And then you do the same thing on the other side for, you know, for 1 to 100. Then you do the same thing for S on, on both sides again. So now, at this point here, now I'm back in scenario 2, where I have both tables are now partitioned on my join attribute. So now I can compute my local join, get my result, send that to a central location, and combine it together. So again, in the, in, in the literature, sometimes this, this would be called a shuffle join, shuffle hash join. It just means you have this extra shuffle step where you're moving data around to put it into the, 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 the have the right partitioning scheme. And again, at this point, it, it, the original data doesn't go away. So I, the, the partitioned tables on, on name and val here, these don't disappear even though I've copied them here. So when this query is done, my repartition data I throw away uh, and, and reclaim the space. Right, so ideally, we talked about this before, we, we want to pick good partitioning attributes so that we minimize the amount of data movement we have to have. So in this case scenario, if all my queries are doing joins on ID, then I'm, I'd be stupid to partition on anything else but ID. But you can't always predict these kind of things, especially in analytical queries. People do all sorts of weird kind of joins, and you may un be unexpected. So there's, there may not be the, the best partition key that can make every join be local and not have to do any reshuffling or broadcasting. Yes? So again, so your question is, when, 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 you, when you reshuffle, and now you have these partitioned on ID. Ah, so his question is, yeah, so sorry, I should be clear. His question is, the query shows up, how do the, how do the nodes actually start moving data around like this? This is, a this is a step in the query plan. This is for this query, it's going to have a step that says, okay, shuffle, and move, take, take the contents of R that you have here, look to see the ones that match 101 to 200, 
send it to this node here. It's a step in the query plan that you have to do before you can move up to the next operator in the query plan where you end up computing the join. So this is done on a per query basis. Where do you put what, sorry? Uh, so his question is, like, yeah, so his, it's like, his question is, where is physically this data? Right? It's, it's, it goes in the buffer pool, just like everything else. right? Because it's, it's data that might exceed the amount of memory that we have, so we need to be able to swap it out of the disk. Right? So in the intermediate results of the queries is, is essentially what this is. right? Like, at every step of the way, like this, this data is, is just there. We bring it into our buffer pool, so then we can start operating on it. Now all of these other things, these other extra copies we're making, plus the output of our joins, these are intermediate results that then also get put out into the, the, the buffer pool. Because if I, had to, if I run out of memory, I want, want, want to be able to swap it out to disk. Is one, what, one node is crashing? So that was the point I was trying to make, I was trying to make about the fault tolerance stuff. So, in a, if you have replicas, then you could, you could recognize that, all right, well, this node went down, uh, but I have another copy of R and S partition on name and value here. And so I'll just go back and repeat this step of, of copying the data over from the other partitions to, to my replica node. It gets elected as the master and can, can re restart it up. Um, If you don't have that, if you don't have a replica available to you, or you're, if you're below your case safety threshold, then the query will just crash and the system will halt. But this is the point I was trying to make in like a Hadoop style system, a MapReduce style system. They do checkpoints at every single long, along the way. They're also a shared disk system. So in that environment, they'd actually be writing these things out to shared disk. So if this node goes down, this other guy could come back and say, well, I know about these other partitions that this guy wrote out. So let me, let me do the work that it was supposed to do and pick up where it left off and the query and keep on running. But that writing out the shared disk for all this is expensive at every, every step along the way. So systems, if you want to get good performance, you try not to do that. Okay. So I want to now introduce now a, a new relational operator that we haven't talked about before, called a semi-join. So in all my examples that I showed you, I'm just showing you that there's, there's some arrow of data going from one partition to another. The question is, what are you actually sending? So as defined in the original relational algebra, like from a mathematical standpoint, you're sending the entire tuple. So if I have 100 columns in my table and I need to do a reshuffle, then I'm, I'm going to copy 100 columns over to the other partition. But we know, for, based on what the query is trying to do, that's actually probably not necessary. Right? So what a semi-join is, it's like a natural join, except that you just send the columns that are needed as part of the, to compute the join, not everything else. Right? So again, so say I have R and S, R has two, three columns, S has, has, has two, three columns as well. If I want to compute a natural join, I would do, have to copy over AID, BID, and XXX, and then three other columns as well. But under a semi-join, I only copy over AID and BID and AID, from these two tables. And I ignore these other columns because they're not needed to compute the join. So this is essentially what distributed systems are going to be doing to compute joins. You look at what data you actually need, to compute the join, and then you only ship that data over. Now there's another design decision you have to make as well. You could say, all right, well, I know I need, uh, I only need one column to compute the join, but I need another column as, as part of the output. So you can decide whether to ship the two columns over together to compute the join, or you can just ship the, the, the in the semi-join, just ship the one column you need to compute the join, then for any filter or any tuples that pass that join operator, you can then go back and get the rest of the data. But now that's sort of extra network traffic to do this, right? extra communication. So this is where the query optimizer can decide, oh, well, I think my join operator is going to have a, a very low selectivity. So therefore, let me not go pass along that second column because I just go back 
get it later, and I'm not going to copy that much data. Or I'm going to have a very high selectivity, you know, a lot of tuples are going to pass my join, so let me go ahead and push along the data that I actually need ahead of time. So that way I don't have to go back and get a lot, of, lot more later. So a semi-join just means that the, the, the data you pass along is only necessary to compute the join and nothing else. And this is the common optimization that, that distributed systems use. Somebody was complaining that semi-joins had nothing to do with distributed systems, and I disagree. Right? This is what every system does. Okay? Yes? So let's say you do have like two, two rows with J3 and one and two in the initialization F. Yes. Will the semi-join have two rows or just one row? Uh, we'll have two rows. Okay. It's like Is it like, are you saying compression as in like, like, like physical compression or logical compression? His statement is that, uh, his, so in, in, in SQL, it, since it's, it's bag algebra, you can have duplicates. So you would have duplicates. I think in the original relational model paper, paper it's, it's, it's based on sets, so you wouldn't. It's like, so again, it's, yes, but think of it in a distributed system. Say I need to get, I need to get R over to S. I'm not going to send over XXX. I just send over the thing I need to compute the join. <coughs> okay, any other questions? Okay. So now I'm going to talk a little bit, and this, this will be mostly like just, me giving you my opinion about cloud systems. Um, so I said last class or two classes ago, I think that shared nothing systems are what most people think of when they think of distributed databases. Uh, and traditionally, most distributed databases were shared nothing. But there's been a large trend now moving towards shared disk systems. And I actually think this is going to be the, the prominent architecture for distributed systems going forward. Um, and this is, this is primarily due to the, the, the proliferation of cloud systems, or cloud, cloud vendors. So now I can get on Amazon, I can get my EC2 nodes, and I can get S3 or get EBS. I can scale out the disk independently from the compute, compute layer. And now I can run HDFS or whatever distributed file system I want on the, 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 the storage layer and have different compute nodes for, the, you know, for, for, for executing queries. So, what vendors will sell you now is called database as a service, DBAS. Um, and the way to think about this is like, I'm, I, I, it's not like I'm getting a VM on EC2 and I install MySQL myself. I go give Amazon my credit card and then they give me back a JDBC connection URL. And that's the only way I can communicate the database is over through, through that connection. And underneath the covers, they're managing MySQL, Postgres, whatever it is that they're selling me. They're managing that for me. So I don't worry about setting up the hardware. I don't set a, worry about too much about setting up the configuration of the system. Amazon or Microsoft or, or whoever does all that for me. So in a lot, of, a lot of organizations are moving towards analytical systems in the cloud, right? Because again, you can get a large amount of storage, a large, large amount of comp computational power uh, very easily. In the case of OLTP systems, the, unless your application is running in the cloud with your database, you, you typically don't run your, your OLTP database in the cloud. Right? It doesn't make sense to have your, your, you have a data center here in Pittsburgh and then you run your, your, you run your application here in Pittsburgh and then your, your database is running in Amazon in Virginia. Right? The latency of that would be very, quite long. So you wouldn't want to use this. You have to run the application very close to the, to the, the database server for transactions. For analytics, it doesn't matter, right? Because our query is going to be very long and, and will run for a long time. So I can't talk about this on, on camera, but there is now a movement, which I think is very fascinating, where the, the line between, the, the demarcation between a shared disk architecture and a shared nothing architecture is starting to blur. So you're not going to have like, a clean separation of the, here's my shared disk, and then here's my, my, my computation that can read data from that disk. 
what you're seeing from some certain vendors now are they're actually pushing logic about the, the database system in down into the, the storage layer. Actually, this is public. So Amazon does this. Amazon on EBS, they have a little shim layer in front of it that for Aurora that knows about transactions. And so rather than having to wait for all the computation to be done up, up in the, in the compute, compute layer, there's some notion of transactions and consistency done and replication done at, at the storage layer. And that allows them to get, get much better performance. They also can go the other direction too. They also can put logic about the, the, the database now in the networking layer. So now it's this weird thing where it's not cleanly like here's your shared disk and here's your compute. There's little bits of the database system at all the different layers of, of, of the architecture. And you can really only do that if you're a cloud vendor because you control the entire stack. So I think that's really fascinating. So the two types of cloud databases you can have, right, as I said, the easiest way to have a cloud database, if you want to call it that, is just you just go set up EC2, you install MySQL on there, and you just run it and maintain it yourself. right? If you want to go as a database as a service, the two approaches are to either have a managed database system or a cloud, a cloud native database system. So a managed database system just means that just instead of you running MySQL and EC2 yourself, they run it for you. Right? They set up everything, they, and they just give you that connection URL to talk to it. In a, and most vendors have something that looks like this. Right? You can go get a, a cloud. When a, if you go look at a, like a database company or a database startup, they, say they have a cloud service or cloud database system available. It's them running their, their regular software just for you automatically inside of a cloud VM. Now contrast this though with what I'll call cloud native database systems. And these are systems that are, are designed from the ground up to explicitly run in, in a cloud environment, right? With elastic scalability on the compute layer and elastic scalability in the uh, in the, the in the storage layer. So the, probably the most famous one is of this is like Snowflake. Snowflake is a distributed uh, analytical data warehouse system that again was originally designed from from the onset to be to run in, in a cloud environment. Like you can't download the software and run it locally. Like you can only run it as a service through them. Google BigQuery is another one, or Bigtable is another one. Redshift was, they bought, Amazon bought Parkcell, and they run it for you in a managed environment, but they've made a lot of changes now to make it more cloud native. And then Microsoft has modified SQL Server to make it also be more, more cloud aware. So these systems, again, are, again, they're designed to be fully aware that they're running in a, in a, in a, in a cloud-based environment and they make certain design decisions to account for that and, and overcome some of the deficiencies and take advantage of the ben some of the benefits you get in, in, in the cloud. So the other big trend that I'm, that, that's coming along for the last couple of years for these cloud systems is these universal file formats. So traditionally, a database management system, when it writes data out to disk, it's writing it out in a proprietary format that only that database management system knows how to interpret, knows how to read. Uh, you guys see this in, in your projects, right? When, when you write out a page to the buffer pool, when you write out a log message, that's specific to our little test database system. I right? know the database system can, you know, they could come along and write support for reading that, but that's not something that most people are gonna do. So now there's been this movement towards uh, having these binary formats that are sort of universal that you can then store in a, in, a, in a cloud system, like a cloud storage system, like S3 or EBS or HDFS, and then have different types of, of database systems be able to access them and read them. And this is more common in analytical systems, right? There's no, uh, there's no universal transactional data format. So traditionally what people do is like, you, the way to get data out of from one database system and put it to another is you just dump it out as like a text file, like CSV, JSON or XML, and then you have some, some, some other piece of code that knows how to then convert that into insert statements or into the format that the other database system needs. So now there's these standardized formats that are meant to be these, these universal lingua that you can communicate between the, these different machines or different data systems more easily. So these are probably the four most famous ones. So the, the oldest one is actually HD5, the hierarchical data format. This actually came out of eight, in the 1990s. So this is a multi-dimensional data set or data file format for scientific workloads. So you don't really see it a lot in organizations. You see this mostly in like, 
you know, big research labs or scientific uh, labs. Um, the ones that you may have heard of are Parquet and Orc. Um, so or uh, Parquet came out of Cloudera and Twitter, and then Orc came out of the, the Apache High pro project. So again, way to think about these is that it's a binary file format that is going to be a compressed column store. So think of like they're doing uh, dictionary compression on columns or other run length encoding, other techniques to compress the columns. And then they have a bunch of libraries written in different languages that know how to read data and write data to, to these files or generate these files. So now there's a bunch of systems that uh, can, and can, can know how to read natively these different file formats. Like so you can take Presto, for example, or, or Hive, you can run write SQL queries that will access tables that will store data in these different file formats. And you just go out to S3 or EBS, wherever they're stored, suck them into your buffer pool, and then natively process them. The newer one that I'm actually very interested in for research purposes is Apache Arrow. So this is like Parquet or Orc, where it's a compressed column store, but it's designed to be for, for in-memory computation, for like an in-memory database. And the, the kind of cool way to think about this is, say I have a database that, that, that I'm generating much data from, a, from the OLTP side of things, but now I want to run like a data science script like in Pandas or, or Scikit-learn. I want to run that computation on that data that I've collected. If I don't use one of these universal file formats, I have to then you know, dump it out of the database, convert it, and then put it back to a form that uh, that like this, my Python script can read. With, with Arrow, the idea is that rather than having ready out the disk into one of these universal formats that can then read, read back in by my Python script, what if I just generated a universal file format in memory and then give you a pointer to that location in memory and you can just crunch on it natively? So Arrow is, again, Arrow is the one I'm actually most excited about and I think this is where everyone's sort of going. So this is sort of, Another aspect of these cloud systems, instead of just being everyone in their own silo, everyone wants to now be able to inter use uh, different interchanges of uh, these, these different sort of universal file formats so that data generated from one type of system can be used in another one. And that's only really been come around the last couple of years because of cloud systems. Yes? So this question is, what is the incentive for a proprietary DBMS, a commercial database system, to actually use one of these file formats? So if you want to play nice with everyone else, you have to do this, right? Like, there's no one system that's a juggernaut anymore, right? It's not like Oracle. Oracle can bend the market to their will. There's enough open source solutions. There's enough, there's, the database system is no longer the center of the universe. You're collecting data from streaming systems. You're collecting data from machine learning uh, programs. Right, like you're having data coming from, come at you from all different locations, and if your if your database system that you're trying to sell can't read these file formats, then you're shit out of luck because no one's going to use you because I, I have a bunch of files that I generated from from this this program I want to use, but you can't read them, so why would I want to use you? Right. So that's another big aspect. I, I think the, the big trend in the last ten years. Uh, MapReduce or Sp Hadoop was sort of the first wave of this. Spark is now, a, you know, it's pushing this even further, where the, a sort of traditional relational database system is not the center of the universe, but it's still an important component in a, in a complex application stack. Like they're not going away; they're just being they're being used alongside of other pieces of software. Okay. So, any questions about sort of cloud systems? <coughs> All right. So we're done. So this is this is it for the content of and, and, and for the course. Okay, the main takeaway from all this is, is OLAP systems are hard. Distributed databases are just hard. If you, can, if you don't remember anything else, remember that. Um, if anybody tells you, yeah, let's just make let's roll our own distributed database, and it's like you and your friend doing it on the side, rethink that choice. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm not saying it can't be done, and I'm all for new databases. And if you go off, if you graduate graduate from CMU and you make a new distributed database or new database in general. Email me because I'll add it to the list, right? Uh, but again, the, the it's just because you're distributed, as I said, doesn't make things be magically easier or things are gonna go faster. There's a whole bunch of other issues we have to deal with, and the, the main issue is now the network. Whereas before, we assumed the network communication was non-existent when we talk about a single node system. 
but in a distributed environment, we have to account for that. And that means in an OTP system, we have to account for losing messages or messages showing up in weird orders. And in an OLAP system, we have to account for having to move data around be between nodes. Okay? All right. So as I said, next class, the VoltDB speaker, if you haven't signed up for the, the voted for the system potpourri, I'll send a reminder, please do that. And I'll send a reminder also about uh, how to turn in the extra credit for a checkpoint ne next Wednesday, okay? <laughs> That's my favorite all time. Uh, <laughs> no. What is it? Yes, it's the SD Cricket IDES. I make a mess unless I can do it like a geo. Ice Cube with the G to the E to the T. Now here it comes, dude. I play the game where there's no rules. The homies on the cup say so I'm a fool cause I drink brew. Put the bus a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a flow to the eyes, show. Here I come. Willie D, that's me. Rolling with Fifth Watt, South Park, and South Central G. And St. Eyes when I party. By the 12-pack case of the 40. A six-pack 40 act gets the real pounce. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say Bill makes you fat. But St. Eyes is straight, so it really don't matter. <laughs>